of the Brockton Public Library and on behalf of the Library Board of Trustees, the Library Foundation, and the staff of the Brockton Public Library, I welcome you to the Brockton Public Library tonight for tonight's event. Uh, I hope you enjoy it and I know it's going to be good. I know their speaker is wonderful and uh, next up I'd like to introduce Jonathan Stroud who's going to tell you a little bit about uh, the program um, in general. Jonathan? Thank you, Paul. Hi, my name is Jonathan Stroud, and it's my honor to talk about the American Dialogue Series. It is a project that was conceived, developed, and organized by Melissa Vega, the Library's Literacy and ESL Coordinator. And firstly, I would like to thank our Library Director, Paul Engel, for seeing how important this topic is and seeing the need to make our library the best community center around. Under the banner of the Brockton Public Library and funded by Eastern Bank Charitable Foundations, this project series will challenge the notion that older immigrant experiences should be separate from newer immigrant experiences. The American Dialogue series is made up of five different parts. First, lectures. Second, forums. Third, interviews, training workshops, and then interviews of immigrants, past and present. Fourth, we will create a new segment in our adult services department. The recorded interviews will be placed on digital files. And lastly, each year we will publish some of the interviews in anthologies. This series is both important and unique. It is important because part of, it is, part of its existence is owed to immigration being a hot button issue in our local and national news. This project is unique because the purpose of this project is to bring two mighty immigrant experiences and conversations in history together. Since they've been separated so far in this immigrational debate, the older English European immigrant groups with the newer African, Asian, Latin American, and Caribbean immigrant groups. Nobody's trying to bring these different groups together except the American Dialogue Series. 
So thank you for coming out tonight and for supporting us, and we hope that you continue to come. Thank you. Yes. And now Amina will do the introduction. Good night. Good evening. Um, it's a privilege and an honor to be here with all of you and to introduce my sister friend, Apoderaza, um, which for those of you who don't know, Keverin Kriolu, Apoderaza refers to a woman of means, a woman who's powerful, and I think that that title is fitting for Miss Tina Cardoso. Tina's a trailblazer. She's the first Cape Verdean woman to run for public office here in the city of Brockton. She's a registered nurse who holds a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from UMass Boston, where she graduated in, in 1998. She's a proud um, family um, matriarch. She has three children, uh, Serena, who I see in the back, who's 29. Uh, Leah, 27, Nadia, 19, and she's the proud grandmother of Ethan, age 7. They all live in Brockton. Um, she lives with her significant other, her children, grandchild, and her puppy, Toby, um, which speaks to just how down-to-earth Tina is, and you'll get to see that in her speaking. She also is um, a primary care staff nurse at Boston Medical Center and Greater Rosendale Health Center. And she's the president and founder of Criales Unidas Incorporated, a nonprofit organization with the mission of encouraging and empowering women to give back to their community through networking, mentorship, and community outreach. The programs focus on educating our communities on important issues such as mental health, depression and suicide, domestic and youth violence pre prevention. In addition, Tina is the co-chair of Rockton's Promise Healthy Start Team. And as you may know, she was a candidate for Ward 3 City Councilor in this recent, um, the past election. Let's give a warm welcome to Tina Cardoso. Thank you, Amina, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm gonna try to like look at you guys and look this way and every which way, <laughs> so bear with me. Thank you to Melise Vega and the staff here at um, Brockton Public Library. This is an honor and a privilege to be doing this lecture series. Um, thank you for Marlicia, did I say that right? Yeah. Your daughter, that was awesome, she disappeared. Yeah, she <laughs> for the national anthem. Uh, Mr. Angles, a pleasure meeting you. Did he take off as well? Yeah, so Summer. <laughs> it was a pleasure to meet you and thank you for putting on this series, for helping put on this series. Jonathan Stroud, it was a pleasure meeting you as well. Thank you to Amina P Pilgrim for that awesome introduction. Amina is a friend, um, a mentor. I've gone to her on many occasions for advice. Um, she is an asset to us here in Brockton. We're so proud of her for everything that she does with the youth here through Sabuda Camp and everything else that she's involved here in the city. And you are Poderosa as well. Thank you. So I'm very nervous. I'm not a public speaker, although I had to be during the campaign. So <laughs> um, I like to engage in conversation, not necessarily present. So I thought what I would do is kind of test the audience knowledge of Cabo Verde or Cape Verde, which is also referred to, um, and see what, how much we know, how much the audience knows about Cabo Verde, which is where I'm from. I think that it's surprising, it'll surprise you um, how little we know about the people that we live you know, with in a community and how little the people who even come from Cabo Verde know about their own country. So I was very young when I came here, so I had to do some research. Um, so not, don't assume that just because we are from there, we know everything about Cabo Verde. So thank you for you guys for coming out. Um, I know that it's tough. It's the holidays, traffic, it's dark, it's cold. So it's tough to come to these events uh, during this time. So I appreciate uh, you folks that are here tonight. So who wants to tell me where is Cabo Verde? Oh, 
So she said it's off the coast of uh, Africa, the west coast, and it consists of 10 islands. And who wants to tell me how many of those islands are inhabited? In the back? She says four. Anybody else? Five. So they're Cape Verdean, so it's not fear, but <laughs> but but there are nine inhabited islands. We have one island that's not inhabited uh, in the Cape Verde Islands. So again, ten islands off the west coast of Africa, about 300 to 400 miles from the west coast and um, near Senegal, and it, we have nine islands that are inhabited. The regions are separated into two. There's two regions. Does anyone know? The names of those regions. I taught you this yesterday, Serena. No? So they're separated into two regions, Badalavent and Saltavent. Wow. Wayward Islands and Leeward Islands. I mean, let me say that correctly. Um, uh, Amina, help me out. Uh, did I say it right? I want to make sure. Windward. Windward Islands and the um, Leeward Islands. So the islands that get the most wind and then the islands that are, that are more um, secluded from the wind. So those islands, the Windward Islands are, anybody know? Sueli, tell them. <laughs> so we have Santantão, Santantão, <laughs> San Vicente, Siniclau, Sal, Boa Vista in Santa Lucia. And again, even myself, who's from there, I have to research some of this because I didn't know a lot of these things. I learned a lot in doing my research. In Sotavent, which are the Leeward Islands are, you said it, um, in Fo Fogo, Brava, Santiago, okay, and one more, Mayu. And the island that's not inhabited is Santa Lucia. Who knows our capital? Anyone? Serena. Praia. Yay, she got one right. Praia. So um, Praia is the capital. It's the biggest island and it the, um, has the most population of people in Praia. Um, anything else? Does anyone else know any facts about Cabo Verde? No? So people in the States refer to Cabo Verde as Cape Verde. Um, and that's what I grew up hearing was Cape Verde. But in 2013, the government there decided that they were no longer going to translate the island's name to Cape Verde. So since 2013, it's been referred to as the Republico of Cabo Verde. Did you guys know that? No. <laughs> so you'll hear Americans struggling to say, Cabo, but that's the proper name uh, for the island is Cabo Verde, but they still refer to it as Cape Verde and use those interchangeably. Um, Cabo Verde, okay, has been a stable, has had a stable economy. Um, it's mostly service oriented and it relies on tourism and foreign investments, but we've been stable since the 1990s and it's actually, Cape Verde is actually praised as an example among African nations for its stability and its developmental growth despite not having natural resources. So we're very proud of, of Cabo Verde for that. So, oh, we should have moved on with the slides. I'll do the okay. Keep going. So that's our flag and these are the islands um, that I just described. Um, anything else anyone wants to know about Cabo Verde or wants to share? Come on, guys. Serena. Absolutely. So there are more um, Cape Verdeans living outside of Cabo Verde than there are actually in Cabo Verde. So that's a good. Our language is Portuguese. We speak the dialect of Portuguese. Yes. I don't believe so. I mean, they, they do learn French, right? Spanish. 
in school. Yeah. Yes. Um, and who discovered Cape Verde? Does anyone know? Of course, it was Portuguese. The Portuguese. Um, that say it again. Huh? By the Portuguese. Okay. And and actually, around the 19th century, it was it was perfectly situated for slave trade. So right around the 19th century when slave, slavery ended, the economy actually tanked. So then it, it you know, revived itself and it's remained stable since then. Yes, and that's how a lot of them actually got over here into Europe um, and other countries. Anything else? Ma'am? <laughs> We've had a lot of issues with our airlines, so that's good to know. <laughs> okay, so just some fun facts. If anybody else has anything else, um, feel free to, to jump in. Like I said, these are things that even though, you know, we are Cape Verdean, a lot of this stuff, especially for folks that came really early on. I was four years old when I came, and my children, you know, there are a lot of things that they need to still learn about our country. And this is such a great effort, I gotta tell you, Melise, because we live in a very diverse city here in Brockton, so we really need to learn more about each other's cultures, you know, so that we're more tolerant of certain cultural um, aspects, you know, of our culture. So, um, Brockton houses the most Cape Verdeans in the U.S. period, okay? So, um, it's important that we learn about the culture. We learn from each other. So, it's kind of hard to see, but in this first picture, this first scene is called Leaving the Motherland. In this first scene, earlier this year when I went to Cabo Verde, I'm from the island of San Vicente, I asked my mother a bit of our history. And I took these pictures. All of these pictures represent where we were born, my siblings and I. So can I walk in? Right here in this, this is where I was born, my brother and I. My mother built a little house there. That land is still there. And, and she had six children and raised them in that little hole in the wall right there. And it's still there. I go, every year that I go by, I go by and, you know, and look at that. That was my mother's first home. This is my mom in the middle of her new home in Cabo Verde. She goes every year to escape the cold. And then the other ones are where my, my brothers, my other brothers were born. My mom was born in Santantão, and she never knew her dad. She lived with her mom and her grandparents. Um, she was... When I asked my mom her story, Cape Verdeans have a hard time sharing their stories. So they kind of try to you know, tell you as best they can without sharing too much. But basically, the story was that her, her grandfather was very abusive towards her and her mother. So my mom was physically abused for, for a long time by her grandfather. And once she was old enough to escape, she left uh, Sintantown and she went to live with um, her godparent, her godmother, and, and her godfather. And in not so many words, she shared how, uh, because of the sexual advances of her godfather, she had to leave that home, um, and then went to Santantown, I mean to San Vicente. So my mom goes to San Vicente, and there she had two children by a man, once again, her words, um, the man was, I don't even know how to say this because I don't want to really like say the word, but she was forced into a relationship with this man and had two children, my, my older siblings. So she went through a lot with him, more abuse, um, which is not uncommon 
in our country. Women suffer a lot. They're the main caretakers of the children and they go through a lot. There's a lot of domestic violence and sexual assault. And then finally, my father is from the island Fogu. My father moved to San Vicente um, to be in the service. My mother washed clothes for service, service men. She never went to school. She never learned to read and write. So she did manual labor, basically. And she met my dad um, and was finally able to break free from the first relationship, met my dad, had four more children, that's us here. When we came to America, I was a month shy from my fifth birthday here. And so my father came over first because his uh, brother and mother and father were here, they brought him over and then brought us over and my two older siblings who weren't his kids had to stay behind. So I tell this story because I know we all have stories and my story is not the worst stories. I'm sure there's plenty of people who have their, their stories here as well. And um, I recently talked to a gentleman um, who felt like, why, do we, why are we doing this? We all have a story, right? We all have a story. But everybody's story is their story, right? And it shapes who we are. And learning all of this, when I went recently from my mom and everything that she had gone through and all her hardships, really shed light on everything that I had been through and why I am who I am. So just, you know, to kind of respect people's stories and to kind of understand that we all have a story and it all shapes who we are. Um, I just have to say that because that was really important because this gentleman didn't understand he felt as if, well, we all have a story. We all go through hardships. What makes Cape Verdeans any different? Just the whole immigrant experience, just that immigration piece adds on, you know, to the, the problems that we already have in our culture. So it's very important to understand the background. So we came to the U.S. and we settled in Dorchester. You can move on to the slide. Welcome to the U.S.A. We lived right in this area, Columbia Road, Savin Hill Lake area, uh, 1979, February of 1979. And during that time, you know, it was still very segregated. So there was a lot of racial tension in Dorchester, Savin Hill, South Boston. Um, and you really couldn't go into South Boston as a black person um, or even Savin Hill because there was just a lot of rac racial tension. Even then, there were a lot of fights. Um, amongst the different groups. There were a lot of turf wars. So it was really rough growing up in, in Dorchester. Um, we lived in several different places because when my mom came over, my dad had a girlfriend. <laughs> so the girlfriend actually helped us to assimilate. She helped us to you know, get acclimated to the States. She took us to register for school, um, to go to the clinics, and all of that. So. There was a lot of tension in the marriage. My dad, you know, had some issues with um, alcohol, and there was, you know, more violence um, when we got over here. So my mom, our family moved a lot. We lived in Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan, um, wherever. We did whatever we needed to do. My mom worked two jobs um, to kind of raise us, going through everything she was going through with my dad. I'll go on to the next one. So, can anyone tell me what this is? That's it. <laughs> Why, what, do, what am I trying to imply with this life? Stories from the home. Yes. So back in the day, I don't know if anybody from any other cultures did this, but we, when we came over, we recorded cassettes and we would send it over to our family to let them know how we were doing. That was the way we communicated with folks back home. So if somebody was going to Cabo Verde, we would ask them to bring the cassette over to our family and we would record, you know, everything that was going on and blah, blah, blah. So this is how we communicated when we were young. I'll go on to the next slide. So there, this is an uh, image of a woman making beds. My mom worked most of her life for the Marriott Hotel and she worked for various laundromats, um, making a dollar to three dollars an hour. I remember, my, like I said, my mom never learned to read or write. 
She signed with an X when she came to the United States. My dad worked for Polaroid for many, many years and retired from there. Um, they worked really hard, you know, back then. It made very little money. And we had, they had the four kids and then sent for the other two older siblings. So there was six of us and the two of them working to feed us all. So it was tough growing up. Oh. Go on to the next one. So who's watching the kids? We stayed home alone a lot back then. And, that, and this goes for everyone. It's not just Cape Verdeans. Or, this is just how it was. We were called latchkey kids. Did everybody remember that term? And um, it was to the point where we were basically raising ourselves at times, because our parents had to work really hard to take care of us, especially as, as immigrants and especially as folks who didn't really have that much education. And so who's watching the kids? They actually called DSS on us when we were little because of this. Um, so then we had to have them send over someone to watch us. So we had actually a nun from the church that would come by to watch us after school. So if you can imagine how tough that was. Um, but we, my mom, it, it was tough for her because Cape Verdeans, one thing they don't like, they don't like to be involved with the legal system, mm -hmm. especially the older folks. Any immigrant population, I feel, they're fearful of their status and everything else. So it was hard for us to have DSS in the home, you know, um, delegating our care. So, move on. So this slide represents uh, my mom and how she signed with an ex when she came to the States. I actually taught her English. When I was five years old, I started teaching my mom whatever I learned in school. So I taught her her ABCs and taught her how to write her name. And um, then she went to school for a little bit and I continued to teach her. Um, when I was around maybe four or five years being in the States, they started sending letters. They started communicating with writing letters as opposed to the tapes. And the letters were in Portuguese and my mom couldn't read. So I would read the letters to her and she would understand. I didn't know what I was reading, but she understood. So that's how we communicated for a while until she learned basic English with my help in the, the log schools, what we called it on Bowdoin Street at that time, where all the Cape Verdeans went to learn English. And my mom went for her citizenship. I'll keep talking. She wanted to become a citizen so bad, she went three times and failed, and then finally got it um, on her third time, a woman who signed with an X. So I was so proud of my mom. She was a courageous woman, hardworking, very smart. Um, and we joked that if she ever went to school, boy, she would cause, she would cause some trouble because she was so smart. So at five years old, um, I began to teach her. I don't know how, I don't know, I can't even explain to you a kid at five years old taking on that task, but I was never really a kid. I was the only girl of five, five brothers. So I had a lot of responsibility. You know, I had to take care of my siblings. I couldn't do whatever they did because I was a girl. Um, so I was never really a kid. We never really played. The furniture was always covered. <laughs> you know, we just had to be responsible. You know, early on, we couldn't make a mess. And that strength, my, mo my mom's strength, strength, she instilled in all of us. So we were always really mature. So when DSS came into our home, it was like, what are you doing here? We got this, you know what I mean? But they didn't understand that. And I think till this day, that's an issue in DSS, DCF now, that it's known, is that they really don't understand, they don't, I feel, this is my opinion, they need to make more of an effort to understand the culture. Because a lot of us are taught at such a young age to be so responsible and not to really be children and not to, you know, so we're able to take care of ourselves in certain cultures differently than others. So I think understanding, again, going back to understanding people's culture is very important. So February 19, 2017, we celebrated 40 years of citizenship. We are all Americans now. Um, and thanks to my mom and her efforts that she was able to get her citizenship and then make all of us citizens. So we were very happy. So this, she, this past year, we went out and celebrated 40 years of, Amer of American citizenship. And we're very glad and fortunate that our mom and dad, even though with all 
the adversities and everything that we went through were able to bring us here to this country and afforded us the opportunities that we have today. So then my story begins. I was very, like I said, I was never really a kid. So at 16, I left home and I was always smart. I went to Boston Latin School, um, but like I said, at 16, I felt like I was a woman. I had, like, I had done so much in such a short time. And I got in with the wrong crowd um, and started dating boys, stay away from the boys, right? And ended up getting pregnant. So I had to drop out of Latin. Um, and by the time I was 18, I, already, I had two kids by a man that was 10 years older than me. Um, and again, not the best situation. You know, it was, again, a violent situation. Um, and I basically raised the, the kids on my own. Um, it's kind of hard to talk about, but I ended up getting a GED. And then I went on to a community college. I went to Roxbury Community College for a couple years. And then I went to UMass Boston. I remember bringing my kids to class when I didn't have a babysitter and begging the teachers to sit in the back of the room so I could get through my class. I had, I should have put this up, my word processor typewriter is what we used back in the day. We didn't have Google, we didn't have, you know, all the computers and everything that everyone has now. We actually went to the library, <laughs> right? And we loved our librarians back then, right? Because they really helped us. You could not get through school without your librarian. And you know, you print up the paper in your word processor typewriter, you edit it, and then you reprint. So I never slept a day in my life when I was going to UMass. Between working full time, going to school full time, I remember going into the welfare office to get help. Mind you, I had my own apartment. I paid $400 rent, went to get help with daycare. They turned me down because I had a job, I made $8 an hour. You know, so I didn't qualify. I remember sitting in the office crying because I didn't qualify for daycare. To, I really desperately wanted to finish school and show people that I could do it. So I really needed that help, and at that time, you know, it wasn't available to me. So I had a really, really hard time with my kids in bringing them to class with me and doing what I can and asking everybody and their mama, like they say, <laughs> to babysit um, so I could get through school. So May 30, 1998, I graduated from um, University of Massachusetts. Very proud day. My two babies right there. Of course, now they're all grown up. They're in the back somewhere. <laughs> we'll go on to the next slide. And now we fast forward to now. Um, with everything that I went through as a teenage mom um, and all my experiences, I wanted to share. I wanted to be able to give back to the community and help others, you know, who are in similar situations. So a year ago, a little over a year, a year and a half now, Michelle, my cousin in the back, we thought about doing a women's group where we would get together as women and support each other through whatever we were going through and encourage each other, empower each other to, you know, do whatever it is that we needed to do, whether it be get a driver's license or, you know, go to school, continue education, whatever it is that we wanted to do. So I started this organization called Criolas Unidas, which is K Verdian Women United. So it took a whole other turn and it became something bigger. It's still growing. Um, and what we are focusing on now is the mental health of the K Verdian community for the most part now, because in our culture there's a lot of stigma around mental illness. At the time I started this, we had lost a couple people here in Brockton to um, murder suicides. So that was on our mind, and we have a lot of issues with youth violence, gun violence, so that was on our mind. So we sat around and we said, what can we do to help out and give back? And we came up with Criolas Unidas, doing the work in the community to help folks understand and help our people, you know, connect them with resources and that type of thing. And we've been going strong for almost two years. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization now. We just got our first grant recently, um, and we're starting to do parenting workshops 
um, helping parents to identify risk factors in their youth, looking at childhood trauma, how it shapes us um, as adults, how it impacts our lives, helping to start the conversations so that we can try to identify solutions. So I'm very proud of Kriala's and Nita's and all that we've done in the community. Um, yeah, so that's me giving back C9. Beautiful ladies. <laughs> Go ahead. And then finally, to add on to that, um, earlier this year, I ran for city council for Ward 3. This was, I, I can't even believe we were talking a little bit earlier that I did this because I never thought, I'm not a politician. Um, I'm just someone that cares deeply about the community. But I thought, you know what? If not me, then who? So I got up and I said, you know what? I'm going to do this. I ran um, against an incumbent of 14 years. So that was really, really hard. Um, and I came very close. So if nothing else, I wanted to encourage and empower, especially women, especially minority women, to be more involved in local elections and to be more involved in the community. That's what the next years of my life I'm gonna to dedicate to is just showing people the importance of sharing your experiences so that you can help others. And I hope that I accomplished a little bit of that with the campaign and I hope to continue that work for three hours a year. Thank you very much. I had a lot I wanted to say. I wrote it down. I told Amina this, but I always forget what I want to say when I get up here. But I hope I shared enough so that you have some background on my story and where, and I, and I think people know where I'm coming from with the stories, because I think a lot of us have similar experiences. And I think that this is such a great effort on your part here at the library to bring people together, especially as practitioners. You know, you want to be as culturally sensitive as possible in your practice, whether you're a physician or a teacher or a nurse or any type of caregiver. Um, recently with Criadas Unidas, we went to the Brockton Hospital School of Nursing and we presented on culturally competent care of the Cape Verdean patient. Um, these kids are going to be graduating next year from the School of Nursing here and we thought it would be important if they decided to work in Brockton to understand the, the culture. When I left there, I got to tell you, I was nervous. I said, oh my God, did I have an impact? Did anyone learn anything? What I, what I, you know, was I making a difference? And the very next day, the teacher called and she said, you know what, Tina, you guys did a really great job. We did this in collaboration with the Cape Verdean Nurses Association. And um, she said, you know what, I learned so much that I didn't know. And our students were very pleased and they learned a lot too that she felt was going to help in their practice. So I commend you all, Melise here, um, and Paul Engel for everything that you guys are doing. It's important. Let's continue the dialogue. Let's continue to have, you know, forums like this so that people in Brockton can learn each other's cultures and learn how to get along with one another. Thank you. Thank you all for participating. <laughs>